This Week in Startups is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. And Squarespace. Start building your website today at squarespace.com. Enter offer code TWIST at checkout to get 10% off. Josh is... um one of the highest rated speakers historically at this event, always in the top five, uh, because he's a product guy who's Good now an investor, you. good senior brother, and um, he's gonna talk about the only metric that matters. Please welcome Josh Elman. Big round of cool. applause. So, so we're gonna go all the way from Bitcoin and cryptocurrency to metrics. And if you were to ask what the metric that matters for cryptocurrency currently, Obviously, it is the Bitcoin price, given the exercise I just saw on stage. So, um, look, this is, this is very different, so I'll kind of let everybody get their, their mind reset, deep breath after all about Bitcoin. And I just love to talk about metrics. I am now a VC at Greylock. Uh, I've backed companies like Medium and Discord and Musical.ly. I used to be a product manager for a long time. I helped build... Uh, I was early at LinkedIn, I helped build Facebook's platform, launch Facebook Connect, and I, I got to work kind of early at Twitter, and I've thought all about how do you take these systems of people, build these new products that you're trying to put in people's hands, and, and really figure out how to make them big and scale and, and get in everybody's hands and, and make these products that matter. And I figure that's why most of you are here. I mean, Jason puts on these great conferences, brings in tons of founders, entrepreneurs, um, you know, people working in the industry. And we're all here because we're trying to build technology products, technology products that can really matter in people's lives. And I like to look, like these are really old versions of these products now that we take for granted every day. That was the first Whole Foods in Austin, Texas. That was LinkedIn back in 2003 when it had a great two-column design and lots of blue and yellow going on. Google's first website, they, they talked about how sparse they were on the homepage. Their first homepage was pretty darn busy. That was Facebook before you could sign up for Facebook. That was the Apple computer before it became the uh, beautiful iPhone. Like, you have to start somewhere, and, and you really have to... Uh, do a whole bunch of work to make this impact in people's lives. And if you get a product right and it starts to make a difference, that's when you get the chance to build more and more and more of those products that can matter. And that's, uh, that's really where um, we're all here. But where do you start? Everybody is trying to build this thing, this product. And each of those companies I showed you started with the launch. They turn on their website, they open their store, and they, <laughs> they have zero users. And on that first day, you got to figure out how to get people to come. Even if you're a giant company and you're launching a new product, the iPhone 8 on, on you know, the day before it launched had zero users of an, or customers of an iPhone 8, and, and you have to figure out how to bring them in and, and kind of figure out if your product's there. And so once you've launched your product, this is when it actually starts to get really interesting. Not that you get lots of users on your first day, maybe you're lucky and you do, but what I tell everybody is like, ignore all the data, look for the stories. Look for the anecdotes. Talk to those first couple users. Do they like your product? Do they not? Do they understand what's going on? Um, and as you start to gather up all these little anecdotes, that's when you maybe start to get data. I like to joke that the plural of anecdote is data because that's really when you start to kind of tell these larger stories in your head. Hey, a whole bunch of people are having an issue with this. Hey, wait, you know, just one or two people are doing this, but I think it's symbolic of a, a bigger issue we have with our product. You need to start gathering those stories because as soon as you start gathering all these stories, it can go crazy, and all of a sudden, you start getting into massive amounts of data. And pretty quickly, if you've launched a website, if you're using Amplitude or Mixpanel or you know, using Looker tied to your Redshift account, whatever you're using, you start to have all these dashboards and you now got to figure out what matters. How am I going to figure out how to build my next product, how to make this thing better, how to make it work? It can be totally overwhelming. You know, as a VC now, I meet a lot of companies, and, and a question I always get is like, hey, is this even thing even working? And I start to hear their stats, and they bring me these data points. Hey, we have 200,000 signups. We have a million downloads, 250 million page views in the last 30 days. Our D7 retention is, 30, is 60%. Our D30 is 22%. Is that good? Is that bad? What are these benchmarks? We have a 50% down mal ratio. And they're asking me to figure out, hey, is this good? Would you invest in our business? And I'm kind of asking them, I'm like, hey, is this good? Do you guys think you have something here that's really working? And, and it's really important that we start to get a common language. And then I'll hear things like, hey, well, this other website had 200,000 downloads and they got acquired for 
$50 million. And this website, you know, had 100 million page views and like they had to shut down. Like what's going on? And the answer to this is not all data points are the same. Like every single story that you need to tell about your product really does come natively to your story. So, so where do you start? And I like to just ask people the simple question when I first meet them. Are people using your product? And it turns out there's actually a harder question to answer for a lot of people. They kind of look at it and they're like, uh, of course. But like, what does that really mean? And so I, I like to think there's a couple ways that you start to dig into what does it mean for someone to really be using your product. The first thing that I like to understand for somebody is why do they use your product? What is it about your product that makes them want to open up the app or want to um, take the product out, you know, out of a drawer and actually use it. And then what's the key behavior? When they open up your product, what is it that they do within your product that starts to matter? And then the last thing is the cycle time. What is the frequency at which they ex um, you expect them to keep using the product? And by the way, all of this is actually what you expect them to do. A lot of people are like, well, I'll just throw it out there and see what people actually do with the product. But I like to say you really want to start with with figuring out kind of what do you believe they're gonna use it for, and, and hopefully you're building some of the product for yourself, so you're gonna build your own assumptions of what you use it for and what's the cycle. So I'm gonna go through a couple examples to explain this in more detail. Um, and before I do that, like just the, the key metric then that I look for when I'm meeting with a company and trying to understand what's working and that we try to aim for with the companies I work with is how many times users perform this core action on the expected cycle that you want. So let's go back to LinkedIn. 2005 now. It still has its beautiful two-column format. And I, I was working there. There was about 15 people in the company, and, and we were trying to figure out how people were using it. And what we really understood for LinkedIn was there were two use cases. One is find, what I call finding, and one is being found. And most people who signed up for LinkedIn were only really signing up because a friend had invited them into their network, and they were there to be found. And if you were there to be found, you actually weren't a daily active user or even a monthly active user of LinkedIn. You were kind of responding to inquiries when you received them once or twice a year, maybe accepting connections to build your network, and that was okay. But the people we really cared about in the early days were the searchers. As we were building the network, we wanted people who were finding other people on LinkedIn, who were using it a couple times a week. And those were recruiters, HR, um, hiring managers, business development executives. And so we really tried to understand these two different use cases for LinkedIn. We were okay that most people didn't use it even monthly, as long as we had these searchers using it and that people were still responding to inquiries that came in. Now let's take a product like Yelp. How many of you use Yelp every day? Okay, not too many. Ah, oh, it's more than I would have thought. How many use it every week? It's like quite a bit more because I think like, you know, on the, the reason that you open up Yelp is when you're looking for a business or a service around you. And, and really, it might not be a need you have every single day, but every week or so, there's probably some business need where you need Yelp. And so as long as you're doing Yelp every, you know, a couple times a week, then you're actually a pretty consistent, frequent user of Yelp. And that means you're really using the product. Then you get to Facebook. And I think Facebook has sort of skewed our understanding of metrics because they've gone out and defined DAUs and DAUMA uh, ratio. And Facebook is a hyper-addictive, incredible product that helps us stay connected with our friends, with news, with the world. People are doing Facebook multiple times a day, maybe even multiple times an hour. And that's sort of great for Facebook. It's an advertising business. It's one that needs frequent usage and frequent checking. But it certainly doesn't apply to all products. And we shouldn't all measure ourselves to try to have the same DAU, MAU ratio of Facebook. We should understand that's why their metric works for them. There's a product called Discord um, on the board of Discord. Um, if you don't know Discord, it's, it's kind of Skype uh, and Slack combination communication tool for gamers. So if you play League of Legends or Overwatch or PUBG or any of these games, you're probably using Discord to find your friends, hook up with your friends, jump into a game, talk to them while you're playing the game, talk to them a little bit afterwards. And so really, the, the way we think about Discord is if you're playing those games, we want to be using Discord 100% of the time. But a lot of people don't play those games every day, so that maybe we don't need to be a daily habit. But for the ones who do play every day, we want to be. And so we try to look at Discord's metric as how much of your game playing time are you also engaging with your friends on Discord? And that's sort of the way that we think about if you're really using it. You know, and then lastly is Airbnb. And I like this example because Airbnb is not a daily habit, weekly habit, or even a monthly habit. It's a couple times a year habit that you travel and you might need a hotel and you'd want to look for an Airbnb instead of a hotel room. That's what's really incredible about Airbnb, and they need to make sure that they're top of mind for those couple times a year. Now, if they don't see you when you do a bunch of your travel in the year, then you're not really using Airbnb in the way they want you to be using it. But as long as you're using Airbnb most of the times you travel, Airbnb can be great. So 
if you think about this kind of user who's really using your product, I like to call them your core users. So core users do a couple of things that most of your users don't do. One, they're top of mind. They come directly to your product, not because of a reminder, notification, or a deal, but they just come, they wake up, and they're like, I'm looking, for a, I'm, I'm looking to travel, I gotta go to Airbnb, or I'm looking for a, a restaurant, I gotta open up Yelp. The second thing is that they're recurring. They come back over and over and over. And the third thing is that they're referring, which is they like your product so much they're willing to share it with others. And so we can actually track which of your users are core users and which one of them are not by looking at a whole bunch of metrics kind of inside of your product. The core users are the ones who are directly opening up your app or your website. They are returning weekly or monthly, and, and you can track the K factor and the number of people who share it. And you can actually score every user in your product to understand which ones are the core users and which ones aren't. And I think a lot of times we sort of treat all those data, oh, we have 100 million page views as the same, when in fact there's 20 million people who generated most of those page views who are really core, and then a whole bunch of flybys who don't matter. So you really want to understand who these core users are. Hey, everybody, let me take a minute to thank my friend Scott Walker. Yes, he runs the Walker Corporate Law Group, and they are, as you know, if you've been a fan of this program, a boutique law firm, and they specialize in the re representation of entrepreneurs and their startups. Yes, they are a great firm, and all their lawyers have decades of experience. There are no junior associates working at the Walker Corporate Law Group, so they're not going to get on the job training with your startup. No, they're experts. And they encourage fixed fees because they think billable hours, well, those reward inefficiency. Mergers and acquisitions, licensing agreements, terms of services, privacy policies, they do it all. And if you want to talk to the founder himself, Scott Ed Walker, you can call him directly, 415-979-9998. 415, that's San Francisco, 979-9998. Or you can email him, Scott at Walker Corporate Law, Scott at Walker Corporate Law, or visit walkercorporatelaw.com and make sure when you talk to Scott, you tell him your Uncle Jason sent you. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, so then we go, okay, I think there's something here. I think I've got these users who are core. I think I don't. I just like to say, like, again, when I'm digging into this for the company, are they really, really, really using your product? And so I'm going to walk through a little exercise of how you can start to determine this for a product that at least has usage that's kind of recurring monthly. This wouldn't work for Airbnb. You'd have to do this quarterly or beyond, but, but at least monthly. And the first thing I like to do is, is just look at month over month usage. Try to understand of all the users who visited you in September, how many visited you in October? And how many days did they come in September? And how many days did they come in October? And what you're really looking for is those users who came a lot in September and came a lot or more in October. Because that means that they're starting to just make it a real habit in their lives. And again, it doesn't need to be every day, but it needs to be something that's, that you can understand and, have, and be frequent. And so we did this chart um, when I joined Twitter and basically mapped out how many days a user came in the first month, which I believe was February, and then how many days they came, uh, what was the likelihood they came that many days or more in the second month. And we graphed this whole thing on a chart like this, and we realized that if you came about seven times in the first month at Twitter, you were over 90% likely to come back seven or more times in the, in the next month. And that meant they say if you were using Twitter once or twice a week, we had a pretty good sense that you were now habituated in Twitter, you were coming back frequently, you were engaging um, with the product in a way that meant you were pretty sticky. And so this analysis really helped us figure out that those people who are coming seven or more times are more core and more sticky than the rest. And then we did an analysis where we, we broke it up and said, okay, those people are core, casual users are the ones who are coming back kind of two to seven times, two to eight times in a given month. And then the, the group who kind of would only come once in February, almost none of them even came back in March. So we called them cold users. And then we kind of mapped this out and we said, what's the likelihood that when you sign up new to the product, you transition into either the core bucket or the casual bucket or the cold bucket. And after you've been in the product for a month, what's the likelihood that you transition? So we, we did this whole analysis. We were able to, to chart this out. And we figured out that basically if you came in core, you're about 90% likely to stay in core every month. A few people fell out, even if they were core users. Maybe they deleted their account or, or, 
Um, they stopped coming as frequently. But we were only getting 20% of our new users to even become these core users. So we knew we had some work to do um, to, to improve that. And as we did make those improvements, we got Twitter's growth from about 10 to 100 million users during my time there and, and way beyond afterwards. And I think they need to do some of this exercise again because I think it'll help them uncover how they get to the next you know, a couple hundred million users. But I think this really helped us at least to figure out that most new users, just we, our onboarding was not getting them to a core state. And then we looked at our data and we tried to figure out why. What do some of those users do that makes them become core? And, and what do the rest do? And we found two things. One is if we got you to follow more than 30 accounts in your first couple sessions on Twitter, we had a much greater likelihood of getting you to core. And it wasn't that we were like, you must follow 30. It was that we wanted to keep giving you tools that helped you get there. Uh, and the second thing we found was we, we called the one-third, two-thirds ratio, which is about a um, one-third of the people that you followed followed you back, which meant that you found friends or like-minded people to engage with on Twitter. And so the, our data really helped us surface these two key insights that we helped drive a lot more users to. But the second thing we did, and this is what's more important, what again, I don't think that many people do with their users and customers, is we just asked them. And we found a bunch of users, I call them bounce back users, who had signed up, not gotten active on Twitter, had come back and had finally gotten active on Twitter. And, and we just called them up and we asked them these four questions. Why did you sign up in the first place? What didn't meet your expectations when you first signed up? Why did you come back to give it another try? And what worked the next time? And what was cool was this set of users was actually really articulate about their journey. They could tell what had attracted them to the product. They could tell us why they didn't actually meet expectations. For a lot of them, they had heard that Twitter was just a great place to like, you know, broadcast to the world. And then they signed up and they had nothing to say. And then they would come back because they heard their pastor or food truck or favorite celebrity was on Twitter. And then um, they would come back and start following a bunch of people and well, whoa, this Twitter thing's actually really interesting. And so we really made a big shift at this time to make Twitter much, much more about following. And again, just, just by calling up users it actually gave us as many or more insights as just trying to dig into our data. So once you understand who your core users are, they're the ones using your product on this regular cycle, you understand um, that they're coming top of mind, they're referring, they're recurring. How do you cherish them? How do you, how do you say like, these are the most important users and I'm going to make everybody else turn into them too. So if you start to have a few core users, you've already done something great. You have people who love your product. So we'll say you've hit some product market fit, but now you want more. Now what? So I'll walk through a couple of ways to think about how you continue to build on this. Uh, the first problem is just look, I, I've got a bunch of core users, but I'm not getting any more people to my top of the funnel. Not enough people show up to my product. So the first thing I like to talk about a lot is how to think about virality. How do you engineer virality into your product? How do you make it so that it's really easy to describe, spell, attract people to your product so it'll actually spread through word of mouth? How do you find these moments in your product, I call these aha moments, that you can use to have people demonstrating they're using their product and showing it off to other people? Um, I still remember the first time my friend showed up in a black car and I was like, what is this thing you're doing? And it was Uber and it was like the, the best demonstration of Uber he could have possibly done, much better than describing it or anything else. If you can create these moments you want. And the last is infectious virality. Can you find a way in your product in which you cause people to invite others to join them, whether it's to collaborate on a document or participate in a small group or something else? So that's, you can actually invest a lot in driving virality for your product once you know you have some core users and have it working. So the second thing is, you get a lot of people signing up. Maybe your virality is actually working. Maybe it's blowing up in the app store, um, but nobody actually sticks around. Now what do you do? Um, and, and I like to remind people that onboarding is a journey that goes all the way to core. And you're not done onboarding a user until they're in that habitual recurring state where they're coming back every time. Um, there's a couple, uh, the first way I like to think about onboarding is it's not a little set of steps you want to get somebody through as fast as possible, but think of it like a learn flow. This is the moment that somebody has chosen to sign up for your product. You have their attention, teach them the product. A company called Musical.ly that we're investors in does a really nice job explaining the product during its first kind of session where you see a bunch of music videos, you see some people to follow, you even get an incentive to kind of create your own. If you're 12 or 15 years old, you probably love Musical.ly and you're dancing and dabbing all the time because Musical.ly really helps you kind of onboard your way into that experience. Um, the second thing is I, I like to think of onboarding is like you have a week. Like it's not just that first session. I like to think of it as all welcome week and how do you actually bring people back, nudge them to come back, explain to them the product more. There's a company called Ritual that does uh, ordering. It's in like Toronto and Chicago and New York. 
And they do a, and, and they kind of, you order with a bunch of your coworkers and you go pick up lunch together, bring it back and, into a shared um, kitchen. They do an incredible job over the first week of teaching your organization how to use ritual and getting you actually onboarded before it starts to work um, with a whole series of emails, notifications in the product, and a little bit of discounting. And so you can invest a lot. You got to think about it as, as how do I bring that person? If I don't get them after a week, then you probably got to retrain them again because you didn't catch them the first time. And then the last thing is social pressure. What can you do with your core users to draw other people into the product? If somebody makes their first post in a social product, how do you get all their friends to like it? Um, TBH, which just sold to Facebook, um, does a really nice job of using social pressure to get kind of, as you play through the game of TBH where you're asking questions about your friends, you're nudging all your friends and bringing them back into the product. So it's a great way to, to keep the active loop going. Oops. And the last thing is, look, you get a bunch of people who sign up, but they don't stay for very long. So, like, you really need to think about your core analysis and, and extend it over time. Look, if you can get people to stay for a month, that's amazing. Now you need to extend and do your analysis over two months or six months. You know, games have this problem where games are sort of always a short cycle. You play a game a lot, and then you sort of finish the game. But products that are durable, that should have these very long retention cycles, I and mean, I'm still using like the same bar of soap that I've been using for like 25 years, like that's a pretty long retention cycle that they convinced me to use, use uh, that brand uh, many ages ago. Like that's the kind of customer and user of your product you want to have. I'm still using Facebook every day. You know, Facebook's been around now for 13 plus years. Like if you can create that kind of long-term engagement with your, your users, you can have a really long-term product. And so understanding churn, you know, is really critical. And ultimately, hopefully, you know, all of these tools and all these kind of ways of thinking come back to just this one thing. It's just when you wake up every day and you look at your product and say, how many people are really using it today? How many people do I believe that are using it today? We'll use it tomorrow and we'll use it next month. We'll use it the month after that. And as you start to get there, that's a, a much easier way to dig into metrics instead of trying to hit some benchmarks that you think some other company does that may or may not actually be relevant to whether people are using their product, let alone yours. So thank you. Let's take a question or two from the audience. Anybody have a question? We have a microphone right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, the microphone's right up here. And uh, you can say your name, uh, but no, um, no pitches, okay? <laughs> Hi, Josh. Uh, my name is Vivian. A uh, quick question on some of the examples you gave. Uh, LinkedIn, Yelp. I think they're marketplaces, so they're two-sided. You need to match the... To, be to find with the to be found. Yeah. But if the frequency is so different, you're finding someone two, three times a week, but you're only responding to inquiries one, one to two times a year, how do you deal with that mismatch? It's interesting. I mean, LinkedIn is, LinkedIn is sort of a weird and bad example for many senses on this because LinkedIn, you know, in jo job networks aren't something where somebody changes jobs every year. So if you're starting to get job inquiries every day or every week, that's actually too noisy, which some people complain now is a problem with LinkedIn. But if you think of something that's more like, um, uh, most traditionally in marketplaces, it's inverted, where the supply is the one who should be getting pinged fairly often. Airbnb wants to have their you know, rooms booked you know, as many times as possible. Or if you're an eBay seller, you want to be selling as much as possible. And it's usually the demand that is much more infrequent. Um, but you want to accept that on either side. You, you just need to understand the cycle. The job seeker, maybe once every other year, is when they're really going to make a move, so you only want to have them get something every, once every other year. The hiring manager is hiring multiple times a month, so they need to be looking for people every month. You know, the Airbnb case is certain seasonable times. Or like the, the VRBO case is like a better example, because that's more for like second homes that are like very actively used during holidays, but sort of sit in frequent other times. So they're very spiky on their calendar. So again, it just comes down to the cadence that you actually expect for either the supply or the demand, and then you can make it. And then you have to build a system that supports that. And part of LinkedIn's value was be find, be found, be findable, so that someday if the opportunity comes to you, you're actually still going to respond to LinkedIn versus annoying you so much you unsubscribed or making it so irrelevant you would never remember it later. Cool. Okay. Take another question. Go ahead. Great. Thank you, Josh. Every time I hear you speak, it's something new. <laughs> then I try and bring it back home to Vancouver, Canada, and the rest of the team, and the trans gets lost in translation. Yeah. Is there a book, a uh, blog, a video? Like, how, how can I take some of these insights yeah. and make them multiplied? You know, I, uh, I would say a couple of things. Um, 
I wish there were great books. A lot of the people who are talking about this stuff, and we've all kind of learned it over the past couple of years, and it's one of these things that's harder to, harder to teach than just do and try. And I think the real thing is, when you hear talks like this, try to take away those three or four key questions that you want to ask, like, are people using our product? How do we actually interpret that for ourselves? And just take that as the key, as the key factor. Because a lot of the ways that this stuff got uncovered was trial and error, much more than intelligent, thoughtful, you know, we knew a book and it said, hey, go do your analysis like this. It was like, huh, are people using it? Well, how often should they use it? Well, how much should they come back? Are they coming back? Can we actually determine which ones do come back? And we just kept asking questions and interrogated our data all the way down. Great. And uh, as a programming note, as a programming note, all the videos are available for $199. Uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> I think as part of the program, you can buy the complete video set. So let's, uh, oh, Josh, hey, one question for you before you get off stage for me. Um, how do you recommend founders deal with a large company which is shameless about copying innovative products down to the pixel that you may have run into in your portfolio. Yes. How do you advise people deal with an at scale, yeah. unabashed thief? It's funny, uh, he's referring to Facebook, I assume. What? But, no. but, but just, just so we're clear, pick up an Android phone and pick up an iPhone. I think there was plenty of copying or learning there as well. Look, at the end of the day, you but we've never seen anything at the scale of what Facebook's done to Snapchat. To oh, I don't know. I, I would argue what Android has done in their ecosystem to the iPhone and the Play Store versus the App Store is equally large. We just, we just allow it to happen in hardware. Um, but, but Facebook to Snapchat is another good example. At the end of the day, you have to own people using your product and create these network effects and create these real big systems where you're actually more advantaged to use this product and join all the other people who are here instead of let them do it. Facebook is its Instagram. These products are at scale. So if they can just add one little feature and all of a sudden everyone's just doing your thing on their product, like that is a real risk. And what I like to tell everybody is, it's like assume that risk exists in the world. If you can build enough compounding momentum, you have a chance to be the ball rolling all the way down the hill. And, and we talk about how Snapchat's dead because Instagram copied Snapchat. Snapchat sells like 170 million people every day. There was a study that teens prefer it as their very number one app. They are, you know, you know, have by far more usage per month than Instagram. So I still think there's a lot of room to build these things that matter, even if you're worried that Facebook might do it too. All right, let's hear it for Josh Hellman. Thank you. Hey everybody, let's take a moment to thank Squarespace, the amazing, amazing service where I build all the beautiful websites that you visit. Founder.university, Angel.university, Launch Festival, LaunchFestivalSydney.com. We use Squarespace because we can make beautiful websites quickly, easily, and affordably. Yes, you can turn on your cool idea into a new website. You can showcase your work. You can blog or publish content. You can sell products and services of all kinds. You can do it all with Squarespace. You can promote your physical or real-world business like I do, my events. Or you can announce your upcoming events or special progress projects. There are tons of beautiful templates, and they're created by world-class designers. They have powerful e-commerce functionality now, and you can sell anything you want online. You can customize the look and feel. You know that with just a couple of clicks. And it's optimized for mobile right out of the box. If you open it on your iPad, you open it up on your Samsung Galaxy, you open it up on your Pixel XL, your Pixel, your iPhone, your iPhone X, whatever you open it up on, it's going to look beautiful. And you can buy domains and choose from over 200 extensions. There are a lot of great extensions out there. I'm using .university, for example. They have great analytics that will help you grow in real time, built-in search engine optimization, which is critical, free and secure hosting, as well as 24-7 award-winning customer support. Nope, you're not going to be left on the hook if you have problems. You just call them right up, and they will help you. Okay, so this is the important part. It's your call to action. Check out squarespace.com and get a free trial. When you're ready to purchase, just use the offer code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T, and you can save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Make it yourself. Easily create a website by yourself. That's what you need to know. And you can make it stand out with these beautiful, beautiful templates that they provide. Go ahead and visit squarespace.com. And remember to use the offer code TWIST to get that 10% off 
your first purchase. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. One of the things we like to do is have um, serial entrepreneurs uh, at the event. Another thing we like to do is have um, investors at the event. Our next speaker is both. I met Rob May by cold emailing him. One of my initial strategies as an angel investor was to look for products I thought were innovative and cool and that appealed to me. One of those was Backupify, which I found uh, either on Hacker News, Reddit, or... Uh, tech Meme. We were on the front page of Tech Meme. Tech Meme. And uh, I said, this is an interesting idea. I'll just email uh, info at. <coughs> and Rob got back to me and I said, have you considered taking money for your business? And he said, yes, yours. And I gave him some money. And I think he sold that company to Dada. Is that the name of the company? Dado. D- Dado. D- yep. And Dado is doing well? Yes, very well. Uh, and and so, Backupify is doing well. Uh, right. What am I going to make? 10x, you think? 20x? At least, yeah. At least 10x. So 10x, which to me is basically death uh, at this point. That's the horrible outcome. uh, Only because uh, with a founder uh, like Rob, you know they're capable of 100x. So 100x is always the goal. So he got 10x, uh, and then he started another company, Tala. I said, I'm okay with the 10x, provided I can be the first investor in the next company which hopefully I was uh, yes. or amongst the first. And his next company, Tal, is doing fantastic. He's raised a decent amount of money for that. And this is one of the key insights I have, which is if you find a great entrepreneur, you want to invest in the arc of their career. And watching Rob's career has been nothing short of uh, miraculous. He is one of the most considered founders, hardest working, uh, and he writes the Inside AI newsletter every week. If you haven't seen that, it's well worth uh, checking out inside.com slash AI for artificial intelligence. Uh, so please welcome serial entrepreneur, and he's also an angel investor in AI companies, Rob May. Thank you. So normally when Jason invites me to these events, I talk about AI uh, because I do run an AI company. I've made 34 AI-related angel investments. Uh, But my own company, Tala, has been um, pursuing an ICO, and I am sure there are many of you sitting there in the audience thinking, I have an existing business. Uh, I wish that I had not taken equity capital. I wish I had started my company now and done this ICO thing. It sounds super cool. Um, Since I have a business is there a chance for me to do a blockchain play and do an ICO? And so I'll tell you a little bit about this and our thought process. Um, And hopefully you can learn something and see if it's right for you. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about me, what's a blockchain and why you can use it, Uh, evaluating blockchain opportunities in your business, the difference between ICOs and tokens. Um, I know some of you may be like, have just vaguely heard of ICOs, and some of you may uh, already own 20 cryptocurrencies. So, um, and then I'll talk about some of the strategic issues we've uncovered for ICOs. I'm gonna try to go through this really, really quick so that we can take questions. So, CEO and co-founder of Tala, um, I do write the Inside AI newsletter uh, for Jason and, and his other companies, so if you, um, you should definitely check that out. Um, and we have an ICO in the works. What is a blockchain? I just put this in here because these slides are gonna be printed out for you, so you can check that out uh, if you don't know. Uh, But there are a couple of key properties, right? One, um, blockchains are distributed, right? So everything, every node gets a copy of everything that happens. Now, almost everything that I say uh, is actually not entirely true for every blockchain. One of the things that's happening in this space is a lot of innovation. So there are blockchains for which this is not true, but Bitcoin, Ethereum, the core things, this is true. It's immutable, the transactions build on each other, so you can never change a single one. So if you took computer science and you know what a linked list is, think about a cryptographic hash, one-way cryptographic hash between each link, so that it becomes really hard to ever remove a link. Um, And they're secure, right? Cryptographic hashes and, and various types of voting in different blockchains enforce these protocols. Uh, There's a whole bunch of criticisms of blockchain, and I read these all the time, and it reminds me, those of you who are old enough to remember the web in 1995 when people talked about how terrible it was and all the problems, they're all true. Um, You know, blockchains are just a database, right? Um, Well, a database is just a list, right? People say, oh, why do you need a blockchain for that? Well, why do you need a database for that, right? Put it in a spreadsheet. Like, just because you can do something another way doesn't matter. The question is, what is the best way? Um, Blockchains are too slow. Uh, You probably read this stuff, blockchains are really fast, they're really slow. It depends on what you're talking about. Um, As a communications protocol, they're super slow. You would never want to pass messages back and forth between a blockchain, it would take forever, because it has to be broadcast to every node, and so your slowest node is going to determine that. 
But blockchains are really fast in terms of settling transactions compared to like if I send you money via Visa or something like that. And that's what people mean when they say they're fast. Um, and then a lot of people say, well, you can do X without a blockchain. Again, yeah, you absolutely can. The question is whether the blockchain solution is a better solution than your other alternatives. Uh, and so I think most of these criticisms are irrelevant. Like I say, all the criticisms of the web in 1995 and 1996, they were accurate, they were true, um, and the web still uh, came out and obviously was very successful. So I think blockchains are good for a couple of things, and this is how I would think about it if you have an existing business. Um, trust without a third party. So uh, without having a middleman, you need to get two parties to trust each other. You know, we're in the AI space, and one of our use cases is how do you get two autonomous agents to trust each other and make sure they're not spoofed or, um, or, or doing something nefarious. Uh, if you need an independent ledger that you just want to be open that anybody can access. Uh, immutability. So one of the problems with a database is, I mean, this is why we have email archiving systems, right? Because I could show up at your office and I could say, uh, hey, you owe me $50,000 for this contract you signed. You say, well, I, I never signed that contract, right? There's a legal process for how all that gets resolved for people. There are a whole bunch of types of things Autonomous agents, robots, AIs being one for which none of that legal infrastructure exists, and I think a lot of that is going to be done on blockchains. Consensus voting on something, and then identity-related tasks. Uh, all the cryptography functions built into blockchains make them really, really good for verifying uh, who you are and what you have ownership to. Tokens. So you can do a blockchain without tokens, right? You can use an existing blockchain, you can create your own blockchain, you can fork a blockchain product and make your own private version of it. You may or may not need tokens. Um, I think you should think about having your own tokens if you do a blockchain, and here's why. I think it's really good for incentivizing a network before it's built. If you can do an ICO and you have this kind of like free money to play with, there, there aren't very many venture capitalists that are going to be like, here's $30 million uh, for your Series A. Go spend 10 to acquire partnerships, right, um, and incentivize people. But, uh, but, but blockchains and ICOs can do that. You can take the tokens, you can give them to partners who can then sell them for cash, and then they can build things for your network. Um, it abstracts away a layer of technology. I think a lot of people don't understand this point very well, but if you, you know, people are going to tell you if you decide to do a blockchain business, just use Ethereum. Well, now your customers all have to go acquire Ether, and let's say in three years you look around and you say, well, I don't want to be on Ethereum anymore. I'm going to move to Tezos or one of these other cool blockchains that's come up that has different properties. Now, everybody that was using your blockchain that was holding Ether has to turn around and dump their Ether and go get the new token for the new blockchain. If you have your own token, it's an abstraction layer away from that technology, and it gives you the chance to say, like, you just need to own my token, and I'll take care of what, what it gets exchanged for and what it needs, and gives you the ability to be cross-blockchain and, and everything else long-term. Um, and then, obviously, sharing economic value in a network. This is one of the primary things that you read about when people criticize Facebook and say it should be done on a blockchain, right? Is that uh, you're the product, you're creating content, you're uploading stuff every day, and you're not getting compensated for it. And network models, blockchain models, give you the ability to share uh, in that economic value with the people on the network. So a really good example of this is Steemit, S-T-E-E-M-I-T, -E -E if you haven't used it. Uh, it's sort of like Reddit built on the blockchain. Uh, you can make money for the articles that you write. It's, it's a pretty cool product. So do you need a blockchain based on what you're doing? Um, can you improve some part of your business with some property on a blockchain? That's the main question I would ask, right? If you look forward and you say, wow, some piece of my business is going to live on a blockchain someday, you should think about whether or not you should own that piece. Um, I think a lot about the way you might have looked out uh, and make the decision of should you have your own server infrastructure or not, right? Are you going to use AWS? I mean, now you would, but seven or eight years ago, a lot of people were running that analysis. Do I use AWS? Do I build my own infrastructure? It depends on what you're doing. Some people today would still buy their own servers, again, depending on what you're doing. Um, you can think about a blockchain as a, as a sort of lower level of technology uh, for most of these applications. Your end users don't care that it's a blockchain. They probably don't even know. But I think you want to look at it and say, um, should I build this myself? Should I use an existing blockchain? Or should I just use a database or something else? I don't need a blockchain. Where to look for blockchain opportunities in your business? Coordination with third parties or independent parties. So if there's some product feature uh, or business thing you would like to do where you sit there and you go, wow, if only I could get these people to work together that would be really awesome, but uh, nobody wants to work together because uh, one person has to be in charge. So let me give you a potential example that I believe may happen. The way B2B companies work today is when you get to be a certain size, uh, you launch a marketplace and an API, and you say, all you third-party developers, come build all the stuff we're not going to build, right? Well, think about a world like the bot world or a new emerging world um, 
where you don't know who the big winners are yet, right? So one of the things that's frustrating as a developer, and I've lived in this world, is that you have to go and you have to write your thing for the Google Apps thing, and then the Salesforce thing, and you have to write your app for each of these ecosystems. What if you could write it one time, and all of the major apps could read it in and share it, right? So that would be pretty cool. How would you get you know, Workday and Salesforce and ServiceNow and you know, all the big companies to agree on a standard? Well, blockchain would be a good way to do that. Um, economic inefficiencies that could be fixed with decentralization. Uh, a lot of times when you have things that get routed through a lot of parties, right, it's just everybody takes a piece and it really adds up. So, so that's a good opportunity. And then things that need trust, ledgers, or immutability. If you need to be able to absolutely prove something, a blockchain is a really good use case um, to look at. And so here's a slide actually from our deck, uh, our uh, fundraising slash ICO deck um, about what Tala's doing, right? And, and a lot of this is having, uh, you know, being able to pay with, with bot coins, which I know is a, is a great name, right? Um, so, so you think about autonomous agents, and you think about the fact that um, you're going to put them out in the world and they're going to do things, right? And businesses have to be uh, compliant with certain processes. So like at Tala, we're SOC 2 certified. One of the things that I have to do if you work for me is I have to have you sign a form every year when I do your review that says, uh, did you read all our security policies in the last year and do you still comply with them? And you say yes. And then when our auditors come in, they look at that form and they see you signed it and I signed it and you read the policies and therefore we're still good to go. How does that translate into a bot world, right? Um, if, I have a, if I have a chat bot that does HR things and somebody who's too chatty asks the chatbot, uh, hey, I've got this weird rash. Um, does our health insurance support STD testing? Well, now, where does that data go? Does that bot have a HIPAA problem now? Because maybe that data gets posted in a list of recent questions for somebody to answer or whatever, and maybe the employee wasn't thinking and they shouldn't have disclosed this. There's going to be a whole bunch of these things that are going to arise as people start deploying bots to do more types of work. And so when you think about how do you make these bots auditable, how do you put them in a HIPAA, SOC 2, some ISO process, um, you're going to need some kind of solution. And so our solution is you create a digital certificate for every single task that the bot does that's a cryptographic hash of the state of the model of the bot, what was it doing, who authorized it, et cetera, et cetera. You store it on a blockchain. Um, you can always go back and audit it. You can put a legal hold on it. You can you know, track down if it just goes crazy and does something it shouldn't do. Um, which if you follow like reinforcement learning models and some of the funny things that happen there sometimes is, is a real, real possibility. Um, so how to think about an ICO. Uh, it's similar in time commitment to raising a venture round. Actually, now that when I put these slides together, that's what I would have said. I would say it's double the time now. Um, and it's just because there's no standard process yet, right? People are still figuring out. And so you're going to get a lot of conflicting advice. Um, it's not like Claire's presentation, right, about raising venture. Like, you're going to get a lot of similar advice if you go to raise venture capital rounds. And there's sort of a process, and people know the documents to use, and you're negotiating around the edges. ICOs are still the wide west, wild west, so it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, most of your current investors are crypto funds and family offices, right? So family offices, somebody's made so much money that they're going to have a whole team of people that just manage their money, right? So a lot of hedge fund billionaires and, and people like that. Um, and then your, your crypto funds are typically early Bitcoin and Ethereum millionaires who have started their own funds. Uh, some venture capital funds are starting to buy tokens, but because nobody really knows what a successful blockchain business looks like long term because there hasn't been one yet, Nobody's writing venture scale checks. Nobody's like, here's $15 million for your blockchain business because it sounds awesome. What they're doing is they're saying, we know there's something here. We don't know exactly what. Um, so we're going to hedge. We're going to make lots of $500,000 bets. So you're going to have to talk to more investors um, to get this done. And they might not be the people that you talk to when you do traditional venture capital investing. So a lot of, like, a lot of my contacts, you know, I've done two companies. I've raised $40 million. Like, a lot of my contacts have been useless for this process. Um, the white paper is the key deliverable. If you read these, they're all across the map. There's not a good standard. Some of them are super technical, and they read like you know physics papers with code samples and everything else. Some of them are mostly like three-page marketing documents. Um, a lot of it depends on you know uh, uh, what you're trying to do and who your target audience is, who you're trying to raise from, how technical is your is your stuff. That's a difficult decision that you need to make yourself. Right, is which approach you want to take, and then be prepared to commit dollars. Um, a lot of people will 
uh, will, people understand venture well enough that they know what it's going to cost. Your lawyer won't bill you to the end until you close and all that kind of stuff. They understand the odds that you'll close. With this crypto stuff, nobody knows. And so you're probably going to spend, I mean, you could definitely do it on the cheap. You could do an ICO for 10 grand. Uh, but if you're going to try to do it right and you're going to talk to lawyers and you're going to have a sort of crypto advisor, which is sort of like an investment bank who's going to help. Uh, and you're going to get some other smart people around the table, you're probably going to spend two or three hundred thousand dollars, right? So you're talking for most of you, you know, one to three months burn rate probably to figure out that, you know, and that might be to realize that you can't do this or you're not going to raise the money. I mean, you read about all these big ICOs, more than 60% of them don't raise anything. So that's something to keep in mind. Legal issues. This is where you're going to spend a lot of time because the SEC and the IRS are constantly giving new guidance. Uh, there are these money transfer laws that I knew nothing about uh, that I now have a um, mild expertise in. Um, tokens are most likely revenue. People debate this, uh, the right way to classify uh, tokens when they, when they come in, but most people right now are treating them as revenue. Um, you want to use a law firm that does crypto uh, and there aren't very many right now. I mean, probably a year ago, there were probably two lawyers in the world that really had any sort of Bitcoin experience. Now there's maybe 12 or 15. Um, so uh, don't wing it, right? Get, you know, get good advice. And then you want to fail this thing called the Howey test. And the Howey test basically is what determines whether you have a security in your token or not. And I should clarify, you can create a token that's a security, right? You can say, this represents equity in my company and I'm only selling it to accredited investors, but it's going to trade on an exchange, so it has liquidity. That's entirely fine. Most people are trying not to have them as securities because the whole point is you can raise a lot more money if you can sell it to the general public. If you're going to sell it to the general public, you have sort of two paths, right? You can go and comply with all the plethora of SEC laws that you have to comply with to sell equity to the general public, which is a lot. You don't want to do that. Um, or you can say, this is an equity. This is like I'm selling Chuck E. Cheese tokens for my video games, right? I'm selling concert tickets for something that's going to happen. Like you, you're, you know, I'm selling airline miles. Like you're trying to treat it that way. And so what you want to do is you want to fail the Howey test. The Howey test determines, yes, this is a security or no, it isn't. You can look it up and understand what the, what the rules are there. Um, you need an ICO strategy. And this is hard because it is a moving target. Right? Clara got up here and said, you want to sell you know, 20 to 30% of your company in your seed round? ICOs are all over the place in terms of what the investors want to see, and they pretty much complain about everything. If you run an uncapped ICO, you can see capped versus uncapped is one of my things. People say, oh, you're so greedy, I hate you. If you're in a capped ICO, they go, oh, I didn't get in because you capped it, you bastard, I hate you. Um, so you're probably going to get a lot of negative uh, feedback from the crypto community no matter what. Um, you should sell at least 50% of your tokens. This is the market standard right now. People want to see 50 or 60%. Uh, that, that flips around. They don't want you to sell 10% and then control the monetary supply and be able to tweak it to your liking. Um, and then really enlist, enlist some strong advisors in the blockchain community. They're going to save you a lot of time and effort. They have their finger on the pulse. Um, you should also start with, uh, with SaaS. This is debatable. There's some people that don't like SaaS. This is a simple agreement for future token. This is actually a security that's neither equity or debt. It's a promise to deliver tokens to an investor who gave you money. And so like the way that we're doing ours is we're going out and raising several million dollars on SAFs from accredited investors and funds. Um, and then you know, we'll sort of use that to buffer some of the cost and make the network get built. When the network is built and launched, we'll do a public ICO where we can sell to, the, to you know, anybody uh, and say, you know, now you need this token to go do the bot-related things on the network. Uh, and then you have to think a lot about what is your monetary policy. We've actually talked about hiring an economist because uh, this is difficult stuff to understand, right? But do you want to uh, do you want to inflate your tokens? Are you going to create all the tokens that will ever exist at the beginning, and there there you go? Or are you going to create more over time? And if so, how are you going to do it? Is there some time-based creation? Uh, every 30 days, we create a thousand more tokens. Uh, does it have to do with mining and work and validating things on the network? There are a lot of different strategies. Um, are token buyers and employees subject to some kind of vesting? People like the early token investors who are buying the SaaS to sort of have to hold those for a year or two to make sure everybody's not going to dump them on the market. Um, and it's difficult. People are still trying to figure out how you give tokens to employees. I mean, it's easy, like, to actually give them is easy, but to make sure that they don't just, like, you know, walk away because they got your tokens, it's hard to put conditions in place on a digital asset like this that nobody controls. That's sort of part of the premise of it, right? And so once you give it, you can't take it back. And so figuring out how you would have vesting um, that had to do with your current employment or something like that is, is challenging. Uh, and then hiring blockchain people. Wow, this is the hardest part of all this. Um, there aren't very many people that are very experienced. So what I would encourage you to do if you go down this path is 
try to hire one really strong, reasonably experienced blockchain person and hire some smart people who can come up to speed under that person, right? I would look for people, uh, if they don't have blockchain experience, distributed systems, cryptography, and security experience is good places to look. So in summary, you don't need a blockchain, uh, but it may be a great solution. Uh, look for places in your product infrastructure where consensus coordination or trust would help facilitate exchange and be good product features. Um, and then don't cut corners on your ICO. You can get a lot of trouble if you do this the wrong way. Heavy fines by the SEC could take your company under. So, um, so be good. And um, with that, I will take questions. This is how you can reach me. Okay, well done. Big round of applause. Um, from our live stream, while we get people lining up to ask you how they can ICO and take down $100 million and a 20% commission uh, for doing so, uh, Iqbal Hamani, Hamami asks, um, how do you make an ICO tangible um, or more tangible and make the right contract between me as a founder and our, my investors, which I think is something we talked about, which is yeah. I own shares in Tala, how many coins do I get and my LPs get in this? And what if your coins become worth more than the company? So this and is how many coins yeah. do you personally own? And how many coins does the team own? Yep. And is this shadow equity? So you can answer my questions first about yeah. my investment <laughs> and then answer Iqbal's. These tokens are going to make you very rich, Jason. How many do I own and how do so, investors get compensated in tokens? And then how do I explain that to my LPs? Yeah. So, or not your um, problem. <laughs> yeah. So, I, so I'm living this right now because most investor agreements and LP agreements didn't consider this. And a lot of, um, a lot of venture funds uh, are subject to different kind of constraints depending on the types of LPs they have. This is why you see so many family offices in it because they just have one LP, it's just one person's money, they can do what they want to do. A lot of venture funds are subject to things like UBTI, right? Unrelated business taxable income, which sort of says, hey, if you're a nonprofit, and a lot of people that invest in venture capitalists are nonprofit, you can't go off and do something that's unrelated to your core business um, and claim a tax break, which you could try to you know, figure out how to do that with ICOs. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of things that you could cause problems for your LPs if you try to give them tokens. So, so you need to think about that. Um, most of the documents don't address it, so technically you have no right or obligation, but I think you want to be a good citizen. What we decided to do was take some share, about 12% of our tokens, and just spread them equally over the cap table and sort of give them back to everybody based on their equity ownership. But you could do other things. You could, um, you could issue a separate class of stock that has no voting rights and only owns the tokens. Um, you could put a, create a wholly owned subsidiary that owns the tokens and people can decide if they want to uh, own that or not. But yeah, I think it's, uh, it's one of the more complicated pieces of this is navigating, not just do your investors want tokens, but can they legally own them given their existing structure? Because you don't want to, the scenario that I'm trying to avoid is we go out with the tokens, in three years the tokens are worth a billion and a half dollars and there's no way to realize the value of what we still own as a company without selling the company. Because if you start looking at C-Corps and you're like, if you're going to sell your tokens on the market, take the cash, distribute the cash to investors, super tax inefficient, right? Which is not what you want to do. So, so you've got to think about this. And the best tax advantage way to get it to people is right before you issue the tokens when they're still at a very low valuation. Because the ICO may not even happen at that phase. Right. Okay. So to the question of um, Iqbal's question of... How do you make it more real? Have you thought about making the tokens have some more real value, or is it just, you know, we'll, we'll see what the value eventually becomes, and everybody's going in eyes wide open. They have yeah. no value today, and there may be value in the future, but this is massively speculative, so we, it's a very high likelihood that the tokens could be worth nothing. Yeah, very similar startups, I think, right? It's, um, so, so you do set a value on the token. You do set a monetary value. You can peg it to another currency if you want. Um, some people have tried that. Um, you know, we're not going to do that. We're going to sort of let them naturally float based on sort of the growth and the interest in the network. But uh, yeah, I don't have a good answer to that. It's a good question. Uh, another question for me. Okay, yeah, you can ask your question. Go ahead. I thought we had no questions. Hi, Jose Casada. So um, very interesting um, I assume that there are many ICOs popping up right now and not that many people who can do the crypto security distributed systems part of it, right? 
Would you consider hiring a third party to do that for you, or this is too scary? Yeah, you can, but even the third parties are backed up, right? So, I, you know, I like to negotiate all my agreements with third parties because I know what I want. And one of the things that you have to do when you engage a lot of these people is they're so overwhelmed if you go back and you say, well, I want to tweak this term or whatever, they just go, oh, sorry, I got 2,000 people in line. You know, you're going you're gonna to be a term taker. So, um, so there are firms that will do that for you, um, do some of that, uh, that build out, but even they're slammed. Okay, next so. question. Hi, Rob. Hi. Uh, I'm just wondering what your opinion is on airdrops and if you think that's a possible good way to get around some of the SEC issues and also if it's a way that as founders we can prove that we're actually trying to build a real company. That's a really great Define question. Define airdrop too. For yeah, so, so, so an airdrop is if you're just going to give away your tokens, right? Um, actually, one of my angel investments did this. This is part of how I got interested in this. But you could go out and you could say, um, I'm just going to give 5% or 10% of my tokens to people according to something randomly or whether they sign up or whether they do some activity and not have an ICO. Nobody gives you dollars for tokens, but then you go list your token after some people have them, right? You go list it on an exchange and it starts trading and then you could literally just sell $50,000 a day in your tokens to, um, to fund your company. I have a company that did this. They gave them away before ICOs were a thing and I get this email that says, hey, the, the tokens we still have uh, are worth $200 million and we're like, sell some of them, right? So you don't have to raise another round. Yeah, as a note, uh, we, some of us, well, not me, but part of our team did that. So if you're going to do that as an airdrop, though, you want to make sure you write into the Solidity contract that it's not able to be listed on an exchange till the airdrop finishes. Oh, Because then point. you run into a lot of problems. But, okay, so, good. Yeah, I think it's a good strategy. I think this is what 21.co is doing, right? They're going to start a Facebook or Twitter cl or Quora Twitter clone or type thing, and yeah. you just earn, you're going to earn for signing up. Yeah, whatever you're doing, you should be playing in the blockchain space at least a little bit because it's going to have it's going to be another big revolution, right? You should learn about it while it's still young. All right, so my question is with ICOs, do you feel that people who are considering doing one, let's say in the first half of 2018, are let's say I was considering doing one, Jcoin for some project. I'm in. You're in. So I just I will tell I'll Give me the money and then I'll tell you what the business is. Um, and uh, so I do Jcoin next year. Am I too early? Am I too late? Or am I just right? What is your intuition? Because you've been in the What's, thick of it. Yeah. Am I too early, too late, or just right in first half of So it changes a lot, right? Because just as we've been doing this since like May, we went through like, oh my gosh, look, people are raising hundreds of millions of dollars. This is going to be awesome to, wow, China's out. We don't even know if we can complete our ICO to like China's back in. They're a big source of the money. And so it's all over the place. I think what is going to happen, and this is pure speculation, right? Based on like living this, this is, this is hard to predict. Um, I think as ICOs tighten up, they're going to become more common. There are a lot of people staying out because of all the legal questions. Um, and as, as those, the business processes and the legal questions and the, the developers and advisors that can do this stuff raise up, you're going to see more of them and they're going to become more structured. They're going to look more like venture rounds. A lot of the venture capitalists are getting into them now. Um, what's going to happen is they're also going to look more like venture rounds. You're going to lose the ability to go out and raise $20 million for an ICO with a cool idea. People are going to expect you to raise $3 million for your network and then sell more tokens in the future when you've proven what you're doing. Um, and so I, I think that's what will happen. So I think you can still get one done, but in terms of raising crazy amounts of money for Jcoin, uh, Jcoin might be the exception, but in general, raising crazy amounts of money is what's going to go away. So it's going to be more muted, and more yeah. muted might be 5 or $10 million, right. you think, like, yeah. rather than $100 million. Yeah, and you can make an argument. I mean, peop and what people like about it is that it's not dilutive from an equity perspective, but you could argue that you might be better in a lot of scenarios to go out and raise a big chunk of equity, build and own a whole network, and sign up partners the way you did it before ICOs, rather than launch a network and give away a bunch of your economics to the network. Like, that's a, the that's a thing that you have to think about as a founder. When I think about it, you know, we have seven, eight companies coming out of each incubator class. They raise between 500 and $3 million dollars. If we had an ICO competency inside of our incubator and we just layered an ICO onto each company in some way, yeah. uh, whether it was a utility token or you know, one that was more of an equity kind of a token uh, or an investment token, and there's all this international money out there, would it m actually put pressure on the syndicate, which is performing at a high level, or the venture community here to participate? What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a great question. I would say yes, right? Because a lot of what gets you funding 
is when people know you have other options and you can just negotiate from a stronger, uh, stronger position, um, I think, yeah, you're always going to you're always going to get more done. So I think if you have tokens as a legitimate option, I think it's going to make it that much easier to raise equity. Or I could just do. What do you think about the idea? Thank you for doing this partial consultation that would have occurred <laughs> over lunch anyway when we're having lunch or going crabbing. Uh, but uh, we go crabbing sometimes together. Um, it's a lot of fun, actually. Um, kids love crabbing. If I were to do an ICO for an incubator class and just said, listen, I'm going to put 250K into each company. If they graduate the program, we'll have eight companies graduate this semester. So it'll be $2 million ICO. You can buy the ICO. It's going to be straight up equity in the companies based on whatever their valuation is will be the anchor. Do you think that would work? I think it would work for two reasons, right? The biggest problem, well, there's a bunch of problems with venture, but... Um, but one of the biggest problems is obviously liquidity, right? And so by doing that, even if it was security and you sold it to investors, like, like you know, I would do that just because it's like, man, if I just decided I want to buy something and I want to liquidate this token, I can do it, right? Um, I don't have to necessarily hold it for eight or 10 years. And secondly, it's going to have the ability for things like that to do a, more of an interesting portfolio play, right? Which is like, instead of me coming in and like meeting all your companies and being like, I like these two and I'm going to go deep, I can just be like, Jason picks well, um, I'm sure some of his companies are going to be fine. Your winners are going to drive the returns no matter what, right? And so, or maybe so do that. the better way to do it would be if we did just Jason's going to invest in 10 companies from his existing portfolio or other companies that he likes, 250K each, and you can buy in, and Jason's going to take a 30% carry, and you just buy the coins, but you can liquidate at any time. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Just buy like a 10 pack of investments. The next Heavy carry though, Jason. 30% heavy carry? But. What are you just, I'm trying to make a living here. What, I can't wet my beak? I'm trying to make a living here. I got three kids. Do you know what private school costs in this town? I got kids to pay. Oh. Right, okay, we'll split the difference. 25%. 25, all right. I'm well, in at 25. It's money from outside. Okay, listen, this has been amazing. You want to ask a question? Get in there. Go ahead. And then I got the next question again. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, I had a question regarding the expense of setting up an ICO. You mentioned it as a yep. couple of hundred thousand to get this done. So what is your opinion on certain you know, new companies like uh, Quine Desk or something, or uh, I forget the name, they are helping you set up ICOs as a self-service. Do you have any thoughts and will there be a market where companies are helping startups set up ICOs because it is so complicated to navigate through? Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of companies, New Alchemy, Ambisafe, Element Group, that sort of came to, they, they work like investment banks, right? We'll help you run an ICO the way an investment bank would help you run a fundraising or sales process, and we'll take, you know, 4%, 7%, 20%, it depends on what you're trying to do and how much, right? Um, and, and then, um, and so those people can be very useful, and I would, I would encourage you to look into those groups because they know a lot, and they know what's going on. Um, and... Uh, they come from two different places. Some people come from Bitcoin up, like, hey, I know Bitcoin, and so I'm going to get into this market. And some people come from traditional capital markets uh, financing. And so, so they do have different approaches. So you're going to want to talk to several of them and decide what, the, you know, what approach is right for you. But um, yeah, but that, that's one way to get it done uh, a little bit cheaper. Um, and they can help you, you know, I mean, you might not do SAFs because SAFs in that, you know, are going to run through Cooley or, uh, you know, some law firm. And so you can do the whole ICO process with one, of those, um, with one of those groups, and they'll just take a cut off the top as you do it. All right. So um, before we leave, Rob, I'll just do a quick promo. At 2 p.m., uh, David Un from Samsung Next is going to do a fireside chat with me just so you have an idea of how active Samsung has been. They're a great partner of ours. They've invested in 66 companies and acquired 25 and they have profits of $13 billion a quarter. So they are very acquisitive. They're investing in a lot of companies. And uh, it's a very important fireside chat for you to see at 2 p.m. when we get back from the break. Let me end with this, Rob. What worries you about what you're doing now? Because I know that you've always been innovative. You like to be on the edge. But this is a time suck and yes. a risk. And if this doesn't work... How will you contextualize it, communicate it to us, your investors, of six months of your life and hundreds of thousands of dollars and missed opportunity with customers? What worries you about this and how are you going to deal with it if it doesn't work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, my style is I would be very brutally honest about it, right? Yeah. That's, how, that's how I write my letters and communicate with my investors. Um, it does worry me. I, I could not have done this at, if I was at Backupify, right? Because the thing that I did differently starting my second company was I built a rock star executive team out of the gate. 
more senior people. With, with my last company, it was always like, who will come work for me for the cheapest amount of money, right? Now it's like, I knew fundraising wouldn't be a problem, so uh, raised a little more money earlier, hired a more senior team. Um, they have done a great job of keeping things running, uh, while I've been often somewhat distracted on this. Awesome. Okay, on that note, uh, let's give a huge round of applause for Rob May. Thank you.